Yeah, my name's Roger Hallam. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a researcher at King's College on how to create radical political change. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is the spring media briefing leading up to April the 15th. Uh, this is Extinction Rebellion. Uh, we are involved in the mass nonviolent breaking of the law. Uh, and this is because we've had 30 years of criminal inaction by the British government on the climate and ecological crisis. Um, in brief, the science is done. We now face extinction. This is a beyond stupid and ridiculous situation. And we're all totally fucked off. And that's why we're taking things into our own hands. Uh, it's humanity's greatest crisis, and how we intend to sort out the situation is through mass non-violent civil disobedience. What we're trying to do is something reasonably specific, which is make free demands of the British government and other Extinction Rebellion uh, events around the world will be making similar demands. The demands are as follows. Um, to tell the truth, which hasn't happened for the last three decades, to stop lying to the British people about the absolute direness of the situation, to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2025, something that we all accept is extremely difficult and very painful, but it's absolutely necessary because the alternative is many, many times worse, and to have a citizens' assembly so that the British people can decide whether they want to live or die, and in so much as they wish to live, then how are we going to get this society and the British state to take the action which is necessary to maximise our chances of survival? There's a, a message that somebody wanted to share with you all today. It really isn't an exaggeration to say that the future of the human race is now at stake. The nature of the changes in climate and environment that we're living with threaten not only the well-being, but possibly the very being of our species and this planet in the long term. And in the middle term, they threaten some of the most vulnerable populations on Earth. It's not at all surprising that people in this urgent situation feel they've got to take non-violent direct action. They've got to find a way of putting the case for the human race before those in power. That's what Extinction Rebellion is doing. That's what the Friday strikes are doing. And that's why I believe a wide, deep support from the public is needed to bring this matter fully to the attention of our political leaders, to show that we can actually achieve democratic change for the good of everybody in our world as well as in this country. So how have we managed to inviting to be in this incredible social movement. One of the things that we've been doing is giving talks in communities across the world. In, in the UK, we've given over 100 talks. I can't give you that full talk today, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of it. The last time I gave it was actually in my hometown, which is a former coal mining community, and I gave it to some uh, builders. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, a flavor of how we talk about the climate crisis, if you like, to ordinary people. We talk about the science, the psychology, the social science of how things change and why we're doing Extinction Rebellion. So, I mean, the first thing to say is that we know the global warming's heated up the Earth by about 1.1 degrees C. We know that there's more fires, more flooding, that the animals are suffering, that it's harder to create food. We've got extreme weather events and we've got extreme droughts. There are about 400,000 deaths annually and those with the least responsibility for this crisis have suffered the most. The Syrian refugee crisis was in part related to uh, the climate crisis. There are countries in the world that are going to be under the water where people have nowhere to live. Uh, people who, uh, children with asthma, those rates go up incredibly in the face of climate change. And the UK has already seen some impacts. 2018 was the hottest summer ever on record for England and it equaled records for the UK. Accident and emergency numbers uh, saw record numbers to do with heart failure, renal failure and dehydration. 
Vegetable yields went down by up to 50% in some parts of the UK. If you remember back in 2014, the UK suffered some of the worst rainfall in 248 years. There were thousands of homes flooded, that's very traumatic, about 1.1 billion in damage. But do you know what? Until this summer, I was a little bit, I was even an environmental activist, and I was a little bit like this lady here, you know, I've got a job, I've got kids, I'm stressed, I've got a load of things to think about. It feels easier to keep my head in the sand about this crisis. And anyway, it's a hot summer. You know, I was really enjoying the heat. Uh, there's that bit of me that's been hoping this is a crisis. I, it's not a hope because I'm a bad person, but it's just a denial, right? Hoping it's a crisis that's going to hit somebody else, somewhere else at some other time, and I don't have to think about it. So what we tell people about this climate and ecological crisis, that when you look at the science, if we want to summarise it, if we stay on this path that we're on currently, we're fucked. If you look at the psychology of it, some of us are going to keep our heads in the sand, but some of us have got to be willing to face up to how completely fucked we are. And the social science actually tells us this is a human-created crisis. We can do things about it. It is not inevitable. We are already in a catastrophe. Bad things are happening. Bad things are going to carry on happening. But there are things we can do, and social science tells us how to become less fucked. So we've done our research. So Extinction Rebellion is saying we fucked with this system. We just cannot stick with it. We've got to move on. This is not about a left or right fight. This is about all of us. When we're telling people this information, we just acknowledge the fact that grief might be in the room, shock, denial, numbness, anger, and that they're all welcome because we have to feel this thing. Because when you feel it, there's a space opens up in your heart for love, and you remember what you love. And when you love things, courage comes, and from courage, action. So global warming is basically about small changes in temperature. We know that four degrees of cooling equals an ice age. 1.1 degree higher than current than, than pre-industrial temperatures and rising. The Paris Climate Agreement said we needed to stay below one and a half degrees C to be safe. And the science says we've got a 1% chance of hitting that agreement. Only 5% there'll be less than 2 degrees C. And the likely range is somewhere between 2 and about 5 degrees C. Could pick around 3.2 as a sort of medium guide. This is awful news. What's already happening is that the Arctic sea ice is melting. And when ice melts, the thing with uh, climate change is that you get feedback loops. It's a domino effect. One thing happens and it leads to another. It's not linear. Once you're in a feedback loop, you can't necessarily reverse things. So when the sea ice melts, you get um, dark water that absorbs more heat, whereas when it's white, it reflects the heat. So the increase in absorption means more heating. A paper came out last year, it was called the Hothouse Earth Paper, and it looked at 10 different feedback loops, there's actually about 60 in reality. It said what's going to happen in the temperature that we're at, coral reef bleaching, uh, the melting of the ice sheets, including the Greenland ice sheet, which increases uh, the water in the sea, and that's already going faster. Fundamentally, what seems to happen with the science is whatever the scientists are saying, it tends to be worse because science is actually quite a conservative process. I am actually a scientist uh, by training in molecular biophysics. So um, the science might have been dismissed previously as alarmist, but now scientists have become really worried. Some scientists suffer from PTSD, they call it pre-traumatic stress disorder. They're watching us not doing anything in the face of their evidence. The melting of the ice in Greenland and Antarctica is going to put up uh, the sea level and those red dots are urban populations of more than 10 million people that are going to be underwater. The World Bank estimates migrations to be of order of 140 million by 2050. We're talking in our children's lifetime, we're not talking in a long time. Another study talks about one in nine people on the move. Again, maybe this is happening somewhere else, but what I show people in the UK is this is the map of the UK, all the ice melts. Now that's something that happens um, potentially over centuries, but by 2050, 10% of the UK population will be affected in all of these uh, cities and also in rural areas. Climate change is just one of many ecological pressures. They talk about the 
uh, evil twin of climate change being ocean acidification set to double by 2100. The oceans actually are seen as the lungs of the earth even more than the forests. And when the oceans acidify, the sea creatures can't make their shells and they can no longer capture carbon in that way and produce food and so much of the world's food comes from the sea. We know that we're polluting our air, our soil and our water from particulates, from plastics and chemicals. We've got water depletion across the world. Again, maybe it's somewhere else, you know, the UK rains a lot, but actually this is where a lot of our food comes from. Uh, we've got soil erosion. Michael Gove said that the UK is 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of fertility. We've got deforestation and habitat loss. And every time we cut down these trees, we turn the forests into net carbon producers rather than sinks because what we leave behind is like a pile of kindling for more forest fires to happen. So we are increasingly being called to face up to this age of en environmental breakdown. Just this month, the IPPR, um, a well-respected think tank, re re uh, released this report that said that mainstream political and policy debates have failed to recognise that human impacts on the environment have reached a critical stage. It's now occurring at an unprecedented scale and the pace and the window of opportunity to avoid catastrophic outcomes in societies around the world is closing. And we're looking at economic instability, large-scale involuntary migration, conflict, famine, and the potential collapse of social and economic systems. This year, David Wallace-Wells released this book. It's a, a review of what an uninhabitable earth looks like. One of the things that people feel like is we can't make changes because what's going to happen to our economy? Well, we have no choice. But every degree of warming costs the economy one degree in economic growth, according to one study. This economy in its current form is finished, it's over. A degree of warming decreased crop yields by 10%, and drought effects at two and a half degrees of warming, which is coming soon, um, will mean that we cannot produce the calories that the world needs. Nourishment in the food because of the soil depletion has been decreasing. So the end of the century projections are talking about a doubling in the population and uh, food production to half. That's why we're looking at mass starvation. Food shortages and even just spikes in food prices trigger social collapse. So this is why people like Professor Shell Nuber, who's the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, He's a senior advisor to Angela Merkel, to the European Union and to Pope Francis, said that climate change is now reaching the end game. The issue is the very survival of our civilization. He forwarded a paper, What Lies Beneath, which says that the science has been understating the existential risks of climate change. So here's uh, Sir David Attenborough. So, you know, one of the things in communities is you, who, who, who the fox Gale Bradbrook, you know? Uh, I happen to have gone to that school in that, in that community, but um, when Sir David Attenborough says things like this, people listen. Right now, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Professor Jen Bendel released a paper last year that talked about societal collapse being inevitable and soon. The reason he was saying inevitable and soon is because of the El Nino effects. We've had a really bad summer for crops. We only need two or three more of those. And as I keep saying, eloquently we're fucked. So uh, immense catastrophe is very likely and human extinction is possible. We know that the extinction of other life is already happening on a vast scale that's accepted by the science now. So here's a paper that was out, I think in 2017, that wildlife is being destroyed by the habitat destruction, over hunting, toxic pollution, invasion by alien species and climate change. It's caused by overpopulation, but especially by overconsumption by rich people. We all count as rich people. So of all the animals in the world, actually 60% of animals are livestock. 36% of animals are humans and only 4% are wild animals. The species that are going to go if we let this 
uh, six mass species extinction carry on, a one in four mammals, one in eight birds, a third of all amphibians, and 70% of the plants. A uh, paper looked at the what's called the insect apocalypse. These little creatures uh, pollinate our food. Um, a 2017 study showed a 75% decline in, in flying insects. You know, you drive your car now, hopefully we're trying to give that up, but you know, the windscreen just doesn't have those creatures all stuck to it like it used to. A 2018 study of British mammals, one in five could be extinct within a decade. So we know that there have been five previous extinction events. Uh, the one that we know about with the dinosaurs when uh, an asteroid hit the Earth, they're all linked actually to rapid releases of carbon dioxide. The worst one, the Permian-Triassic Permian extinction, caused runaway climate change. What happens is you get a mass release of CO2 from uh, things like uh, volcanoes. Uh, then the methane is released uh, from the permafrost. You get a mass die-off. You get mass amounts of hydrogen sulfide and everybody's gas. In that particular extinction event that we can see from the geological re record, it wiped out 97% of all life. We are releasing carbon dioxide at a greater rate, and the Earth is heating at a greater rate than the Permian uh, Triassic extinction. So we know what the mechanism could be that sees extinction in our children's lifetime. So the possibility of human extinction was looked at in this 2017 paper, looking at the carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere. And they said that anything over three degrees C is catastrophic by 2050, and that beyond five degrees C is uh, beyond catastrophic. You start to need biblical terms to talk about climate change. Sounds a bit weird. You can't find the language. Um, Ramanathan, who was one of the authors of that paper, he said, this is like an equivalent to a one in 20 chance that the plane you're about to board will crash. We'd never get on that plane with a one in 20 chance of it coming down but we're willing to send our children and grandchildren on that plane. So the UN Secretary General called an emergency meeting last year to talk about climate change and how it poses an existential threat to humanity. He said, if we do not change course by 2020, so let's move away from this 12 years as if we've got some time and space for this. We've got to change course in this year. Um, we, that, that we will, we, if we want to avoid runaway climate change. Every day, I'm faced with the challenges of our troubled and complex world. But none of them looms so large as climate change. If we fail to meet the challenge, all our other challenges will just become greater and threaten to swallow us. Climate change is quite simply an existential threat for most life on the planet, including and especially the life of humankind. Talk about government policy to people, but in a nutshell, we're rearranging chairs on the Titanic and we are kicking the ball into the long grass. Uh, we have to face reality that there's been a lack of concrete action. The first IPCC report was in 1990, 28 years ago. There's been a 60% increase in CO2 levels since then. Professor Kevin Anderson from the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change said, we've been through periods where we'd rather question physics than the economic model, that scientists have been self-censoring, and the policy makers are always looking to some silver bullet for the future. Dr. Kate Marvel of NASA's Goddard Institute says to be a climate scientist is to be an active participant in a slow motion horror story. We are inevitably sending our children to live on an unfamiliar planet. She gives talks about climate change and she's asked to talk about hope at the end. It's a bleak story. Tell us a happy ending, give us hope. The problem is I don't have any. We need courage, not hope. Well, I guess the thing that makes me feel hopeful is that the things that we need to do to solve the climate crisis solve the ecological crisis as well. The things like rewilding the planet, re using regenerative agriculture that captures soil, captures carbon in the soil, it gives us better food, um, 
renewable energy, reducing what we use, uh, reusing things, reimagining our economy, you know, getting together and thinking, how do we do this differently? And right now, in order to get the political will to have all this stuff happen, we're not saying which thing should happen, but here's some examples, we have to rebel. So we, so we tell people this information and say, what do you do when your government is actively promoting climate chaos and driving extinction events? No matter where you sit on the political spectrum, you have both the right and the duty to rebel. And what the history books tell us is that civil disobedience is an incredibly important part of social change. It's not enough just to simply write to our MPs and sign petitions and make donations to NGOs. We know from the data that it takes up to 3.4% of the population to rise up in active participation in mass civil disobedience to see the change. And that doesn't mean everybody getting arrested, but that's about 2 million people in the UK. So uh, civil disobedience is about being willing to risk arrest, being willing to take jail time. Several of us were in court this morning. There's Dr. James Hansen, the grandfather of climate science, Caroline Lucas. The, the things that we, the, the rights that we have in this country because people were willing to make sacrifices. When there are frightening things happening in the world, there are people that want to look away from the thing that feels fearful, and they're called the bystanders. And there are some of us that think we have to look at this thing in the face and tackle it. And as Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. So we launched Extinction Rebellion with the demands that Roger read out to us, that we want the government and the media to tell the truth about what's happening to reverse inconsistent policies and to communicate with citizens and communities about what they need to be doing. We want the government to enact legally binding policy measures that will reduce carbon emissions rapidly. No more balls into the long grass, please. And they need to cooperate internationally so that the global economy uh, reduces its consumption levels. Uh, we're not doing the ecological overshoot. And we're not saying, in Extinction Rebellion, we're not saying it's this way to do it or that way. We'll all have opinions and ideas, but we want a citizens assembly that's fit for purpose, that is a new form of democracy to look at this. We don't believe that the democracy that we have is functional and is going to see the changes that we need. So Extinction Rebellion, we launched it in um, October. It's gone exponential since then. Uh, we have engaged with up to a million people across 65 countries. There's 206 groups across the world in 24 different countries. We're pushing about 100 groups in the UK. And when we talk to people, we go back and we give them training in non-violent civil disobedience. And we ask if they're willing to get arrested or go to prison. So there's some figures here and some figures about our reach on social media and so on. Um, a friend of mine recently said that social movements aren't created, they're invited into being. So many people have said they've wanted this moment and needed something. There's something very traumatic about facing this time and not doing anything about it. Um, I, I was just going to um, share something from a Facebook feed this morning. Because I'm a mum of uh, 10 and, and 13 year old boys. And uh, this came into my Facebook feed this morning. It really spoke to me as a mother. She said, um, my heart broke a little bit this morning. My youngest son, who's now eight, overheard his big brothers talking about climate change and the disrupted state of this beautiful planet. And he came to me and he threw his arms around my waist and burst into hot tears. And he said, I wish you'd never been born and cried and cried. And I told him there are good people everywhere who are doing everything they can to bring our earth back to thriving. And he looked up into my face with his big blue eyes and he said, but not everyone is doing it, are they? And I had to say, no, not everyone is doing it. I rubbed his back and told him that he can do, what he can do is to love the earth and encourage others to love and care for the earth. He left the conversation okay, but I'm not okay. It hurts deeply to feel the distress that some of our children are feeling right now. They know the earth needs us all to love and care for it and her. The way that we care and love our children. Our children need us to do this. They need to see us taking loving action for a thriving, sustainable future, their future. I want to be able to tell my son, and I'm with her, I want to tell my sons too, that everyone is doing it. Everyone is doing all they can to restore our world. 
to bring back the insects, the forests, the rhinos, the jaguars, the clean rivers, the healthy oceans. Will you join me in doing all that you can? of written material, which says a lot about me. Um, you know, I'm a nerd. I've spent the last 25 years writing reports, giving legal opinions, advising mainly the small island governments and the least developed countries, the LDCs as they're called, in the climate negotiations. I've been doing that since 1991. Um, I have four children. My daughter is 24 because she was born just before COP1, which I attended. So it's quite a personal and emotional journey for me every time a COP comes around. I remember you know, my own journey as a young, optimistic lawyer, thinking armed with law and everything I'd learnt you know, at the finest schools from this country, Pakistan and uh, universities here, that, that we would be able to tackle climate change, which was just a future problem at that time. It really, really was. We wrote the precautionary principle into the climate change treaty in 1992. We spent uh, a lot of time and effort trying to get um, the best science uh, sorted out. I myself have been part of three IPCC reports, the second, third and fourth assessment reports. And I have to say that that process has changed the world, but it has not stopped climate change. And climate change is accelerating much faster than I think even Gail's presentation made out. So I get all the science journals. They arrive in my inbox, summarized in some cases, not summarized in other cases. And this morning, when I was working at 6 AM, a summary of the article which is um, reporting on sea level ice and um, Arctic melt and Antarctic melt is quite devastating actually. Um, it is happening uh, right now, it's happening very fast, it's locking in um, meters and meters of sea level rise um, and all sorts of impacts which will affect the world's poorest countries, which will affect the world's poorest people and which are affecting pretty much everyone on the planet. I'm going to show you some of the work that um, I've been helping uh, XR do. I'm part of the political strategy team and I also support the international work. So some of that led us to go and talk to activists, to governments, to indigenous leaders, to all the NGOs. You know, there were about uh, 15, 17,000 people at the last COP, COP24. My name is Hindu Umaru Ibrahim. I'm from Chad. I'm representing the Mbororo pastoralists who are the indigenous peoples of Chad. And when I come here in the COP24, and then people start talking about numbers, 1.5 degrees, and others say yes, some say no. I feel that so ridiculous to talk on the things they do not understand. Science tell them. We have the window of 12 years to make change. And they are still denying. So the impact I'm seeing, how will be the survival of my peoples? We already lose a lot. Now, what are we going to lose? Our life, the extension of our culture. We make the first world war. We make the second. We have to take lesson because the third is the environment one. But the third, it's much criminal than the first and second because the third is thanks not only peoples but all the environment. So that's what makes me sad and that's what I feel when I talk to you about that. I'm representing the 47 poorest countries in the world, the least developed countries group, and we represent nearly 1 billion people in these climate negotiations. 99% of climate-related 
deaths happen in the least developed countries, the research have found out, even though they contribute only 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have much time left. It's not actually 12 years. For these poorest countries and communities, it's 12 minutes. My name's Fahani Amin. I'm here, you know, officially on the delegation of the Marshall Islands. I've been in these negotiations since 1991. I've been to 22 of the last uh, 24 COPs. Um, and I'm very frustrated with how things are going, so I've joined the rebellion. Here in Poland, we're building networks, we're making those links of solidarity, we're here to learn from each other, learn from other groups who are grassroots movements who are already taking action in different countries. And um, we're pushing the COP to have a more radical outcome. We've been very specific about the language we're using, about telling the truth, and we're also specific about the language that this is an emergency. Climate change is a reality all over the world. Uh, it's been a reality for poor people in poor countries for some time now. It's actually now becoming a reality for rich people in rich countries as well. If you look at the wildfires that hit California recently and the hurricanes that hit the East Coast recently causing quite a lot of death and damage. So we've passed the threshold of thinking about this as being something that will happen in the future. As of 2018, it's already happening and we're going to have to move it from being an urgent issue to being an emergency. Since I last addressed COP in 2009, nothing much seems to have changed. Perhaps now it's time to tell ourselves some hard truths. Carbon emission keeps rising and rising and rising. And all we seem to be doing is talking and talking and talking. You know, people are no longer waiting for some global consensus. They are suing their governments. They are suing the carbon major companies. They are blocking roads and bridges. They are organizing school strikes. And this is only the beginning. What I heard today is that this is the beginning of the emergency coalition here. So we're in. Thank you. Well, I, I think it's for people, time for people to get out in the streets to do civil disobedience and to show governments that it's time to take action. Uh, as the IPCC report made clear, we're facing a true planetary emergency. We're running out of time. Uh, I have been to all the cops except one since 1995 and they have not made the progress we need. We always support freedom of assembly, we always support freedom of expression and when there are issues of concern and especially issues that have such an impact on our livelihood um, and the future of the planet, uh, we think everybody should rise up. You heard there from about uh, the representatives from about 80 countries uh, representing around 1.3 billion people and also representing Climate Action Network, which is around 1,300 NGOs and the Indigenous Peoples uh, Forum Leader, Hindu, who introduced that uh, section. And these are, these are people who have, you know, like me, spent a lot of time in domestic politics and international politics and going to meeting after meeting. And they are now generally saying, it's time to do civil disobedience. It's time to get out on the streets. It's time to rise up. Because, frankly, I'm sort of holding this report. This is the last report I wrote, and it came out at a COP meeting in Marrakesh, I think 24 hours before Donald Trump was elected president. And I think it's the challenge to the research community and the people who've done the campaigning, lobbying, and insider work is actually, we don't have a system anymore that listens to reason, to science, or people. And that's the reason why I've joined the, rebe the, the rebellion. We have to create a system that actually is accountable, that works for the interests of the people, and that listens to them. And that's what I think the, you know, I'm a bit nerdy, and I do, do like the demands, actually. I sort of study them with quite a lot of care when I decided that exile was quite a cool thing to do. So the demands for, to create a citizens' assembly is a really core part of what Extinction Rebellion is working for. So it's not just about arrests and the actions which are very exciting and which you'll hear about next. It's actually a demand to create a system that can put in place 
the kinds of policies, the kinds of programs, the kinds of things that we need to do on the time scale that we need to do them. And generally that time scale is five to 10 years at the most. That's the demand to get emissions that XR is putting forward to zero by 2025 and to reduce consumption levels, uh, uh, also to protect uh, 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 the ecological damage that's occurring irrespective of climate change. So that is partly uh, what I would love, you know, as journalists for you guys to focus on, is to focus on what XR is saying is wrong about the system and why we can't just leave it to the COP and why we can't just leave it to the Climate Change Committee's review of the UK's long-term targets. Uh, to sort of sort out because in fact the entire system is you know out of kilter, out of touch and is certainly not working fast enough. We've entered into really dangerous territory. We've, we've decided to do a link up with Ghana um, and technologically it was working earlier on <laughs> and, and, uh, but we'll see now. Um, uh, can, can you hear me? Mabu? Yes, yes we can hear you. We are working with Extinction Rebellion because uh, we want to rally the genuine international solidarity that we need to be able to forge ahead. Because earlier than that, long ago, we have been doing this, but nobody helped us because we have been deprived by the government. The very so people who are unconcerned about the climate breakdown in Ghana here. So they only allow us to reach out to the international community about these kind of issues. So we are very happy working with Extinction Rebellion because we think that Extinction Rebellion is a greater movement, a global movement that will provide us a security, a safeguard with those people taking the initiative, putting our lives to resist or to, 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 to protest against climate breakdown here in Ghana. Uh, we are relying on Extinction Rebellion to give us the genuine support that we need to be able to clamp down completely to, 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 to zero degrees. By 2020, we should all experience globally pollution-free plastic free and then our earth should be as clean as everything that we need so all that i want is that i need all your support the international solidarity support for us here to be able to do everything that you you, you are also doing and first and foremost let me congratulate all of you over there for your effort for your immense contribution towards our efforts here for us to be heard internationally. Congratulations to all of you. Expect us more tomorrow. This is a call to you here as journalists in the room to come together, act with us, to tell this truth. So I'm gonna start from the, from the beginning. And um, the beginning is April the 15th. 10 a.m. in Parliament Square is the beginning of the International Rebellion. And we are expecting that you, along with thousands of other people, will be there. We're going to be shutting down central London um, for multiple days, and we're going to see that replicated in cities internationally. We're going to see beautiful acts of non-violent civil disobedience, working already at the moment with artists, with architects, with gardeners, with performers, with circus-skilled people, um, with people that are going to make beautiful food for the rebellion um, to create these amazing pieces in central London that shut down the city and tell the story of our demands. So just to remind you, those demands are that the media and the government need to tell the truth and act on that truth. And then we've got the science. We need to listen to the science and we need to go carbon neutral by 2025. And we need people to come together come together under these demands to discuss in a more democratic way how we can solve this crisis. And so we're going to see people on the street, just like we saw on the bridges back in November, discussing how can we solve this crisis. So 
to move on from that, we're going to go back to how are we going to build up to that beginning of an international rebellion. Well, on the 9th of March, we're going to see around 200 activists pour blood outside Downing Street. And this action is about rebelling for life. This is about the future of our children, and this is about what we're calling the blood of our children. So that's going to be on the 9th of March in central London. And we're going to see actions around the country around that time as well. And if you want to hear more about those, there's people in the room who are organizing things elsewhere in the country that you can talk to at the end. And then, of course, on March the 15th, the next youth strike for climate is going to happen in central London again. Again, um, On the 15th of February, we saw 5,000 young people come together in central London around 15 to 20 more thousand across the UK. And those, those young people, the creative placards that they made, the creative chants, they said things that I can't repeat to you right now. <laughs> they, they are incredibly intelligent and they know what this is about and they know that they're gonna keep organizing. And when they share something on Snapchat, that thing grows like wildfire. So if you think February was big, the 15th of March is gonna be huge. Um, but then, this isn't all about just getting arrested. This isn't all about going out on the street and taking action. We're organizing a massive festival, the Spring Uprising, in, in the middle of March, the 16th and 17th of March. And that festival is going to bring people together. Um, it's going to be a celebration, but it's also going to be a chance to um, bring about this culture of regeneration. We're rebellion. This isn't a one-off protest. We can't just send people on the street to get arrested. We need people to have the longevity, to have the energy, to sustain themselves, to be a sustainable movement. And so we need these kind of things to keep us going. And then, of course, we're going to be training about 2,000 people in how to take nonviolent civil disobedience that weekend. And this is all building up to the beginning of that rebellion. So, no Brexit on a dead planet. On the 30th of March, we'll be blockading a massive road coming out of the port of Dover. And we're going to be talking about the fact that no food means no future. Now, we've already seen climate change affect the lives of thousands of people across the road. But this is about bringing it home to the UK. In a few years, food prices are going to rise hugely in this country. And that is going to affect every single family about how they put food on the table. And this is talking about the serious issue about how this affects everyone in this country. And then, from the end of March to April 15th, we're going to be painting the streets. We're going to be telling the truth. Um, and we're going to have hundreds of people going out all across the country, fly posting, doing small acts of civil disobedience to tell the truth, to get people on board, to make sure no one misses that key date in April. And also, from the end of March to the beginning of April, we're going to have the Earth March. So this is groups of people who've already been getting together to organize how they're going to get to central London on the 15th of April. And they're going to start walking. Actually, some of them who are coming from the end of Cornwall are going to start walking on the 15th of March. There's also going to be groups starting walking from Scotland. And as they get closer to London, they're going to join together. And we're going to see more and more people coming together. And that is why we can expect thousands of people on the streets of London for the International Rebellion on the 15th of April. So these are our, our key messages. And that is what you're going to see covering central London on that day and on the days and weeks that follow. So we've also got, as people have mentioned, hundreds of groups um, across the world that are taking action almost every week. And we're going to see lots of different groups taking action all across the country around different things. Again, the media, the BBC telling the truth. We've got local councils who've already declared climate emergency. We're going to see more of that. We're also going to see more of this regenerative culture with people supporting the people who were on trial from back in November. We've had people who were in court today, some of those here that you can talk to later. Um, we're also going to see more street parties reaching out 
to the local communities and also creating this culture that we want to see. I'm Juliana. I'm a, I'm a model of one and a three year old. You've probably heard them already. And uh, we've, uh, together with a few other families, we start Extinction Rebellion uh, Families for London. So we've been a support base in the actions as well, but also we are trying to support each other mentally. And uh, I think we believe we're the first generation that we are raising kids with the fact that we are in the climate breakdown and how do we deal with that and how do we support them. And I think we, we believe that it's our role as, as parents, not only as mom, but as parents to raise resilient kids and to, to tell them the truth in a way that they can handle. And I think in the light of that, after the first, on the bridge, that's when I joined the teacher rebellion, my three-year-old wouldn't, she just wanted to know why there were no animals there, and things like that. And I think I really realized if, if it's to bring them into this, we need to explain. So I wrote this, this little book that's called Our Fight. And it's just kind of explaining to them in a nice way that, you know, that things are happening to animals, but they are going to be the ones fighting for that, and, and they can be the voice. And, uh, and within the, the Extinction Rebellion Families of London, we are also providing kind of a few activities, like family-based, because there are a lot of people that are not so sure about coming to actions. And I think just to build up that community and make it easier for everybody to understand that we are non-violent and it's actually lots of fun to be there. Yeah. We're here from regenerative culture, a really crucial part of Extinction Rebellion that sets it apart from other activist groups, building in right from the beginning the, the care and stepping towards uh, the care of activists and how we look after each other, try to model the change that we want to be in community how we are going to look after each other, building a robust uh, community, looking after each other in the face of the change that is inevitably coming. Jasmine, and also Welfare for Actions. Yeah. Um, Utterly I, yeah. important. And this also includes, this is about, it's about weaving it into the entire culture. We're creating a new thing here. Uh, but also very much about supporting people at actions because it's not short term, this is going to be a long fight um, and that's, that's what we're here to kind of support people in doing. And this is where we need people that can't risk themselves, this is how we look after people who are putting themselves at risk and when people for lots of reasons can't actually be at risk of getting arrest, what they can do is plug into regenerative care and look after the whole community of XR.